You know, you can tell George is an old friend of mine when he can sort of pimp me about on time. Um, look, I, when I heard about this, when George asked me to come, uh, someone had described this as a lecture. And, you know, I think of lectures as something that smart people do and they impart learning, right? Uh, so this can't possibly be a lecture, it'll be a talk. And the reason for that is I'm in the airline business, I'm an airline executive, so by definition, I'm not smart, all right? <laughs> And secondly, I'm in a business that hasn't earned an adequate return on its invested capital since the Wright brothers. So I'm a slow learner as well, all right? <laughs> so what I'll talk to you about is, I'll talk to you a little bit about the airline business, and then I'll do a small, while I'm doing this, I'll do a small commercial for the new United Airlines, because I want all of you to fly us, and I want you to pay, always book at the last minute, pay the highest fare, that's the key. <laughs> um, and then I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about, about uh, leadership as well. Uh, let me start by talking about the airline business. It is an extraordinary business. And I like to say, and, you're, and most of you are, 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 are uh, getting your MBAs, your PhDs, uh, uh, you know, if you like the business of business, there is no business like the airline business. If you like making money, forget it. Uh, it's a tough, tough business. And it's a tough business because there are a lot of structural problems with the business. It has very low barriers to entry. I like to say any idiot can get an operating certificate, and many do. Um, <laughs> it has very high barriers to exit, because everybody who touches us makes money off of us, whether it's the airframe manufacturers, the engine manufacturers, the aircraft lessors, uh, the uh, cities uh, where we operate, uh, whether it's, it's the avionics manufacturers, uh, the, the folks who service the lavatories, you name it, they make money on us. And as a result, nobody wants us to die. And that's why you see so many airlines that go into bankruptcy and yet they get reconstituted and they come out. They don't liquidate, they come out the other end. And so you have, you have basically an open opportunity for new entrants and a cap on exit and therefore you tend to have an overcapacity which tends to drive down fares, which tends to make us unprofitable. We're also a brutally regulated business, recognizing that the airlines were deregulated in 1978 um, only nominally. We are the most heavily regulated, deregulated business that there is. And some of the regulations make a lot of sense. I mean, certainly the safety regulations make enormous sense. But sometimes industrial organization is mixed in with safety. Uh, and um, consumer protection is mixed in uh, in regulations in ways that, that, are, that are fairly oppressive. Uh, for example, you probably know that the air traffic control system in the United States is quite antiquated. Um, it's safe, don't get me wrong, it's safe, but it's just very, very <laughs> slow. Uh, and it uses the very finest 1950s ground-based radar technology <laughs> that money could buy. And uh, we need to invest in that system, but, but we haven't as a nation. And as a result, it's, it's a, it, it, the system uh, has, has very limited throughput, and, and particularly in times of bad weather, that's why you have all of these, all of many, many delays in, in bad weather days. But if, as a result of our antiquated air traffic control system, our airplanes are stuck on a taxiway for more than three hours, we get fined $27,500 per passenger. Per passenger. Now, I'm going to give you a little clue. We don't charge that much per passenger, <laughs> right? And, and, and so as a result, we have lots of regulations that are very oppressive uh, on, on, on the air carrier. Someone actually recently said, well, why don't you charge for air tickets because fuel is so important to you? Why don't you sell an air ticket? And then at the last minute, whatever the fuel price is that you're going to be using, that will be the cost and the customer's credit card will be charged that. I mean, it would be a logical thing to do. Well, the federal government about a week ago outlawed that practice before we could even start that practice, even if any of, of us were. So we're, we're very heavily regulated in the ways that we advertise, the way that we operate, the ways we price our tickets, even though nominally we're, we're a deregulated business. And we're also subject to, to uh, external events that most businesses are not. I mean, last year, last April, uh, uh, there was a volcanic eruption. Uh, the name of which I've never been able to name that volcano, maybe one of you can do it, but it really shut down air travel in Europe and, and was a, it had a, some, a fairly material adverse effect on air travel. Now, who could have thought when you were planning for the year that you would be subject to a volcano or subject to SARS or, or subject to any of a number of, of these external events that, 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 that affect our industry? And certainly the price of fuel is, uh, you know, is, is remarkably difficult for us to handle because not only is it an important input for us, um, in fact, it's our single highest cost. We spend more on fuel than we do on our people worldwide or our aircraft worldwide, our facilities worldwide. 
or anything worldwide. And uh, when, we, when, when fuel is such an important input price, and it's quite high and quite volatile, to give you a concept of how much, I mean, George mentioned $25,000 a minute, which is a lot of money, which is why I try to talk really, really fast, right? But if, if you think about what it is, at, at, at United Airlines, the new United Combined Continent and, and, and United Airlines, we, for what we spend on fuel, we could buy a brand new Airbus A380 aircraft. You know what that is, that really big aircraft that spins little regional jets around like tops. You've, you've probably seen that. Um, <laughs> we could buy a brand new Airbus A380 a week and throw it away for the price of what we spend on fuel. And so when you've got that size of an input price over which you have no control, now you can do hedging, and we do hedge. We, we do typical uh, hedge, using typical financial products to hedge. But the reality is ultimately those hedges burn off and you have to pay the higher price of fuel. And you've got to figure out a way to recover that higher cost. And this time around, this bump in fuel in 2011, we're, as an industry, doing a better job than we were in 2008. In 2008, uh, 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 you know, a lot of airlines got in a lot of trouble with high, very high fuel prices, and the high fuel prices peaked at $172 a barrel for jet fuel. We're paying today about $136 a barrel for jet fuel. Uh, so it's pretty close to what it, what it had been at its peak. But we've done a much better job of pricing to it. Uh, we've had a number of fare increases this year. Uh, and we're also doing a, a better job. As you, obviously, as you price your product higher, you're going to have less demand, and we've done a good job adjusting our capacity so we don't have too many seats chasing too few butts. But in terms of capital costs, huge capital costs, uh, very sophisticated financing, uh, which we do for all the capital we do. Technology, we have, we're essentially a technology company with wings. It's a very data-rich business, a very data-rich business. And as a result, uh, we have a lot of information on which to make a decision, but we also have a lot of data, and you've got to figure out how to parse your way through that data. And I'm sure many of you uh, have been faced with a whole lot of data and trying to figure out what, seeing through this, 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 this fog of data, what actually is, is very important to you. So it's, it's without question a difficult business, and as George mentioned, it's also a heavily unionized business. And that imparts its own set of difficulties. And certainly in a, in a merger like we're doing, we, we did the merger because we were, this is a network business, and having the, the, the largest single network in the world is very valuable. And also there are lots of other assets you get in a merger of the size that we've done. For example, our loyalty program, our frequent flyer program, has more members than there are citizens of France worldwide. Um, and and that, that, that imparts a lot of value, not only in the, in the loyalty of the customers, uh, but also in, in our ability to, uh, to sell miles to third parties like Chase, the credit cards, things like that, uh, is really valuable. But bringing together, bringing together carriers uh, has its own issues, uh, and certainly the, the work groups are, are a very difficult issue. We have work groups that are represented by the same union. We have work groups that are represented by different unions. We have work groups, some of whom are not unionized at the, on the continental side and are unionized on the United side. And you've got to bring those together, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a long process, but an important process. And you've got, to, you've, got to earn, you've got to earn the people's trust over time. I think the most difficult thing in, in bringing two carriers together of the size of Continental United, it really is cultural. Because we are very two different carriers with two different cultures. And, and, and Professor Parker is, is well, uh, you know, well versed in, 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 in the old continental culture. But that's really important in a service business. And, and I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about that as I talk more on the sort of the, the leadership aspect of this. Um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get together 87,000 diverse people, as we are in this, in this merged enterprise, you've got to have a vision for them. And that's what I'm paid to do as CEO. But importantly, you've got to have a plan that they understand. And if you, if, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, right? So you've got to have a plan. And, 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 and at, the, at the new uh, uh, combined carrier, we're using a plan um, that we have used on the continental side for 16 years. It's a simple one-page plan. That is, everything we want to do is on a single piece of paper or a single iPad page, as the case may be. And it's important that people understand that plan. It's important that, you, that, that everybody understands it. And it's most important that you tell people that if what they're working on, if they can't trace it back to that plan, then they should stop what they're doing and do something else. Because you can, you can distill everything you want in a business into a marketing plan and into a financial plan 
and into an operating plan and into a people plan. And what we do at the combined carrier is we just take the most important things that we're going to be doing for the year and we put them under each column for the marketing plan and for the financial plan and for the operating plan, for the people plan, list it out, and we make sure people understand what they're working on and why they're working on it. And it's really important to show that and get that out and around the system so that people know where you're going. Because people want to believe in a future, but you've got to show them what the future is going to be, but then you have to show them how to get to that place. And so having a key, a, a simple, clear plan is incredibly valuable for leading change, bringing businesses together, uh, leading your troops. And going over it over and over, and it can get repetitive, I understand that, but it's important that everybody understand how they fit in. Because, you know, from, from the perspective of, 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 of you know, a person on the ramp uh, throwing bags, they want to know what, what part are they, how are they participating in the carrier? How, what are they doing? How are they contributing to the future? And they can do that by understanding what we're doing in the plan. The, other, the second thing I'd want to ma make sure you understand for your own leadership positions going forward from, from what I've learned is the incredible importance of getting really talented people to work with you and work for you as you become leaders yourself. Uh, there are people who are insecure and they won't hire really good people because they want to be better than the people who are reporting to them. They want to know more. My theory has always been you go out and you find the very best people that you can find and you hire them. And you actually try to hire people who are better at your own job than you'll ever be. And then leave them alone. I mean, a lot of people micromanage and there's nothing more dispiriting to people who work for you than to micromanage. If you've, if you've hired the right people, and you've given them the tools that they need to do their job effectively, then you ought to trust them, and you ought to let them make some mistakes. Now, I don't mean mistakes like I mistakenly took some of the company's cash and put it in my bank account. Not that kind of mistake. <laughs> but let them, let, let them run with it, and don't micromanage them. And you know, what you'll find is 99 times out of 100, they'll do the right thing, they'll be really good, and the one time out of 100, you may have to sit down and give them a little counseling. But it's really important to hire the very, very best people and then make sure they've got the tools to do the job and then let them run with it. Because if you're constantly, you know, if you're constantly in their underwear, I'll tell you, it makes their lives miserable and you'll drive good people off. Whereas if you give them lots of responsibility and let them run with it. Now, it's important that you not get sandbagged. I mean, what I tell my own direct reports is, you go run with the business and you go do what, what, what's right, but keep me informed. I don't ever want to discover something material you know, at a board meeting. It'd be nice for you to tell me in advance, so make sure you don't sandbag me. But it's important to get those people and, and, and let them run. Now, that's not to say as leaders that you can't get intimately involved in portions of the business. And I would encourage you to do that as well. I mean, I reserve the right as CEO to go do kind of, you know, put my nose in whatever I want to uh, from a business perspective. But it's, and it's important to know that because there are leaders who are at, you know, 40,000 feet all the time. They're sort of the, what I would call the business roundtable leaders, you know, the talking heads on TV, the people who make broad generic statements but don't actually know what's going on in their business. And you can get isolated really quickly uh, as you rise up through the ranks. Now, I've got, for example, I've got eight SIDA cards, security identification, identification display area cards. Those are the things you use to go airside. And I had to go, by the way, wa watch eight separate spot the terrorist videos to get this thing, which is really an unpleasant experience to have to go through to get these badges. But I will tell you, it's really valuable because I can go airside. I can go and just walk in any break room, and I do that alone without an entourage. And it's really valuable because you get to know people over time. And, and make sure you're also mixing with the folks you're working with. I mean, on every airplane, I go up on the flight deck before the airplane takes off, I talk to the pilots. The reason I do that before the airplane takes off is if I do it in flight, they lock the door and they won't let me out. Uh, and they have lots and lots of questions. I like to answer their questions, but there's a limit to, 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 to what I can do, right? <laughs> um, and, and again, I, and then I work all the galleys. And I talk to all the flight attendants. And I go into break room. So over the years at Continental, I know thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And that's really valuable as a manager because that way the people who report to you can't bullshit you. I mean, they can tell you things, but you can go one or two or three levels deep and get the real information. And the fact is the people who now, who now work for me know I can do that, so they don't bullshit me because they know I can, I can dig in the organization. And that's, that's, that's really valuable. But I think the most important thing that you, can, that you can bring as leaders in the future to your own enterprises, whether they're the for-profit or non-profit, is, is the culture of the business. I'm a huge believer that culture matters in a business. 
Uh, now, I'm in a service business where, where it's sort of, you know, obvious that culture is important. And we have different cultures at these two airlines. I'm trying to bring together a culture. And, and uh, it's even more difficult because, because this particular transaction that we did at United Continental was a merger of equals, where we didn't acquire, we at Continental didn't acquire United, and United didn't acquire Continental. We're trying to bring together the best of both, but we're trying to bring together the best of both cultures. And, and, and you know, I sort of, I, I've always lived my life by two rules that my sort of mommy taught me, which, which is treat other people like you'd like to be treated and never tell a lie. It's really simple. And you can be successful doing that. And at, at the airline, sort of treating each other like you'd like to be treated is what we call dignity and respect, treating each other and treating our customers with dignity and respect. That means being honest with people. That means, that means thanking people. And I'll tell you, many people, again, as you progress in your careers, you have folks who are working for you. You, know, you, 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 you thank people with, with financial incentives, and you structure them appropriately. And that's why we're all in business, because you, know, you do, you do want to get paid in business. But even more importantly, often, than, than the financial incentives, even more important than that are the, the personal thank yous. I mean, and I don't mean, the, I don't mean superficial. I mean, having people who've done a really good job and go, taking the trouble to go to their office or go to their cube and thank them personally. I mean, it makes a huge difference to them. And I would encourage you as well to always remember that there's so many people who work really hard and work all through the night to make you look good. And you need to make sure you're thanking those folks as you go through your career and build up those relationships because it's incredibly important. But treating your coworkers with respect, treating your customers with respect is incredibly important. And also being op direct and open and honest. It's always better to tell the truth if you make a mistake, get up to it quickly, it can be fixed. At least some mistakes can be fixed, most mistakes can be fixed. But being open and honest, and in my business, that means not only being direct and open and honest with my, my coworkers, but also with customers. So if there's a problem, there's a delay, say what the delay is, tell people why there's delay, and if you don't know why the aircraft's delayed, then say, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. And explain what's going on to people. People much prefer that than, than silence or the runaround. That also means when I go out and talk to coworkers, I do, I do uh, CEO exchanges, something similar to this, actually, where I speak for a few minutes, and then I open up for a half hour questions of, of my coworkers, and they've learned over the years on the continental side, and the United folks are learning. They can get up on a microphone, they can ask me any question they want, and I'll give them a direct and open and honest answer. Now, sometimes that means telling them something they don't want to hear. I don't always agree with them, but it's not when someone comes up to you with an idea that you know you'll never do, it's not patting them on the shoulder and saying, you know, great idea, I'll consider it. It's saying, no, we won't do that, and here's the reason why. Or when someone stands up and, and makes a, 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 you know, a group of, of folks from the union step and make a demand for a contract that you know will not be, in, not only in the long run interest, interest of, of the company, but harmful to the rest of the coworkers, explaining that you'll never do that. And use the word never. It's a tough word, but it's a true word. That is, you'll never do a contract that will jeopardize the future of the company or jeopardize the future of the coworkers. Now, people sometimes don't want to hear the tough message, but it's important to give that tough message. You can give it politely and you can, politely and you can do it respectfully, but it's important because when you do that, when you've got, when you've got a culture that's built around uh, people treating each other with dignity and respect and direct and open and honest communication, what you build is a, is a company where people enjoy coming to work every day. They trust each other. And they, they learn, and, and, and management needs to do this, earn their trust, but they also learn to trust management. And even in a unionized workforce, you can build a relationship with a unionized workforce where the workforce thinks of themselves as employees of the enterprise first and union members second. If you have it flipped, where it's union first and, 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 and enterprise second, that's, that's a path to ruin. And you can build that culture where people enjoy coming to work, they trust each other, they trust management, they're proud of what they do, and they deliver tremendous service as a result. I'm sure many of you have worked over the years for, for, for various enterprises, and if you think of places you've worked where you're really proud to work there, where you're proud of the product, proud of the, of the brand, um, you'll do a better job. There's an old saying in the airline business, you know how much faster you can fix an airplane if you want to, right? I mean, it's true. And you can, you can get so much more out of people if, they, if they're proud of where they're working and they see the future and they're rewarded for it. And it can be any of number of things. At, 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 at United, we have perfect attendance programs uh, by work group. If people have six months of perfect attendance, we put their name 
in a, in a, in a, in a revolving drum and we, and we pull out every six months, we pull out a name from that work group and the winner gets a brand new car with all the taxes paid and the gross up on the taxes and everything else, so they actually get a new car. Uh, we have on-time bonus program where if our, our aircraft are, are 80 percent or more on time despite what Professor Parker said, we are an on-time airline. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, domestically or internationally, we, uh, or both, we, we, pay, we pay a bonus for that. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we, have, we, we have a profit sharing program, so, so when we make a profit, when, the, when our coworkers work together and deliver the profit, we share the profit. That's what makes a great workplace, and that's what ultimately makes, makes a great company. So I would encourage all of you in, in your future, in your leadership positions as well, uh, really, I've had, a lot of people ask me this all the time, you know, because I've had a really checkered career. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of different things in my life, and I never thought I'd be in the airline business, and I sure as heck didn't think I'd be running the world's largest airline. But what I've told people is follow your passion. Don't go into investment banking because that's cool and everybody's doing it. And don't go into consulting because it's cool and everybody's doing it. Go follow what you want to do. If you've got a passion for investment banking, go for it. If you've got a passion for consulting, go for it. If you've got a passion for, for working in the high-tech sector, go for it. But go for your passion because money is important. There's no question about it. But beyond a certain amount, what matters is really enjoying coming to work and being proud of what you do and, and, and believing in the company and believing in the future of the company. And I'll tell you, I've had jobs where I was unhappy. And it's a lot more fun being in a, in a, in a job where you really enjoy what you're doing and you enjoy the people you work with and you're proud of what you're doing and you want to continue to improve the business. It's more, it's more personally satisfying. So follow your passion. Ignore the herd and be yourself. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people think of, of, of you know, business people being sort of stuffed suits. Um, but the reality is, is the best thing you can do and the way you can advance your own career and the way you can be most satisfied is simply be yourself. I like to joke, if you're an obnoxious liar, then probably you're not going to make it in business. That, not that, that kind of be yourself. But, but Follow your passion and be yourself, and, and I think uh, certainly with the background of Stanford Business School, you'll be incredibly successful. So I'm going to stop right there and start, uh, and, and, and start taking questions, but I, I want to end by thanking you very much. I'm honored to come here. I'm certainly honored to, to be in this spectacular, look at that, people way in the back, hi there, um, in this, uh, in this uh, spectacular auditorium at the beginning of, of, of this uh, brand new Knight Business School, uh, and I want to thank uh, Professor Parker for, uh, for inviting me. Thanks a lot.